Guys, we're just getting ready to do open gym. Got about 20 minutes before people probably start showing up. But um, my buddy Wes and Taylor came down from the Center for Neurosomatic Therapy. And uh, yeah, they're right here in Clearwater, so they come over and do some work with us every once in a while. But we're getting to some really interesting stuff. We're talking about how a lot of the, the manual therapy work that Wes has done has supported him in increasing his static posture, but it doesn't translate into your movement capacity. Exactly. And a lot of the work that these guys are doing individually, as well as with Ashley, Ashley Missouri, yeah. over at the school in Fairwater, is to figure out how you can take the, the work that you, do, that you do in the static posture and translate it into everyday moving. Sure. Right? So what are some of the things that you guys are coming up with with regard to how to, to change someone's uh, muscular imbalances, not just statically, but also so that it can move differently? Well, and she, that's the thing, is she's the only one that's really been experimenting with it. We haven't been doing the work long enough right. to really see, okay, you have a good standing posture, but when you go to move, you throw everything off because you know, your, your glute max isn't firing correctly. And that's, that's the problem with me, was that eventually I got out of pain and I was in good standing posture, but if I wanted to go work out again or if I wanted to go do some kind of activity, I ended up screwing myself up again because I wasn't using the correct movement patterns. I wasn't trained biomechanically to stay in proper alignment no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm getting out of a car or squatting, right. it doesn't really matter because you're gonna lose your results if you're not like stable. instantly, right? Yeah. I mean, you could get right off the massage table. I mean, it, it, it'll last maybe a week, you know? You uh, might not be in pain for a while, but, uh, and it's usually, because obviously we're not working with athletes that much. We're working mm -hmm. with people that are in chronic pain, right. with chronic health conditions. So they're not moving around that much. They're usually the people that are in bed. Yeah. So it takes a little while longer for them yeah, to not like lose the go results. And, beat ourselves exactly. up. and I'll lose the results the next day. Yeah. So it's like, where's the balance? So let me ask you guys a question because what you guys do at the, at the center works on the, the neuromuscular system and then also some components of the visceral system, right? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I, we learn organ massage. <laughs> so, um, two things that I often consider, and you uh, work with you in this way also, is uh, do you guys take into consideration the atlas and, and how well, that yeah, may play? Yeah, I mean, we, we do oh, atlas corrections. We can actually correct it ourselves. When we measure the atlas, we can see if it's sheared or if it's tilted or rotated. Mm -hmm. And we learn to correct that stuff. Um, it's not like as immediate as if you were going to like an advanced orthogonal chiropractor or something right. like that. Uh, it's obviously not nearly as accurate, but it still can make a huge difference. So usually we start with the atlas. If, if it's clear that that's what the issue is, we'll start right. there and kind of work our way down because the higher up you go into the spine, the more important you know, the neurology is. Right. So that's usually where we start is atlas if we think that's, that's the main component of it. Right. Because I mean, you could, you could work the body as much as you want, but if that's off, sure. then everything, the and fire That's, that's why off. we have such a huge assessment. I mean, it, you know, when you're first starting to learn this stuff, it could take you an hour and a half to do yeah. all of those measurements because you're looking yeah. at everything. And it could just be one little fiber of one little muscle mm -hmm. that's tight, then, you know, you don't find it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't consistently recheck measurements, consistently, um, if you're not, taking everything into consideration, not just the atlas, but lumbo pelvic hip region, all that stuff. I mean, it's all, it's all connected. Oh, also, like, I, it turned out that I had one leg shorter than the other the very sure. first time I met with yeah. Randy. Yep. And it was like, well, no matter what work we do, I might have fixed the fact that yeah. one leg is shorter than the other. Perpetuating factor is what they call it. Okay. Uh, Travell and Simmons, I don't know if you're familiar with the Sounds familiar. Uh, myo pain, myofascial pain and dysfunction. So it's two big, big two huge, books. thick red books. She basically invented the term trigger point. Okay, um, yes. So, oh, yes, of course. Know, about, and Paul worked with her a lot. Uh -huh. um, and she's the only person that's really come out and explained how, and even with chiropractors, they, they look for leg length inequalities, mm -hmm. but they kind of tend to think that they can just fix it by pushing your pelvis into more flexion and getting right. your legs to even out, right. that's not elongating bone. You know what I mean? You've talked about the difference between a functional short leg and a structural short leg. Right. With a functional short leg, you can easily fix that by manipulating the pelvis in order to drop that foot down. But if you have a literal structural difference between your two femurs, you can't elongate that. You can't pull a bone shorter than the other one into the same position. So. If you don't address that, obviously you're going to continue to refacilitate that same hip height or that sh low shoulder right. or whatever. Hold on, hold on, 
elaborate on something Wes was talking about. Hey, before about. you go, though, yeah. I want to congratulate you on trying to speak over the fucking garbage man. <laughs> and that, and that <laughs> noise. Fuck me. This is what I deal with. I so usually I just wait. Okay. But hey, sometimes you can just yell. I know you're getting closer to it with the camera. I'm like, what the fuck? What are you doing? Just wait for it. It's just like that. Like every 20 minutes, there's, there's noise. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Uh, something that I want to expand upon and what he was talking about uh, the structural leg length difference versus the functional leg length difference. Um, a lot of people don't think it exists because of the way chiropractors were taught to mm -hmm. see um, a structural short leg or a functional short leg, which is they don't actually look at the head of the femur as compared to the bottom of the heel pads. They'll look at like your umbilicus right. down to your heel pads and then once those two heel pads align, then they say, oh, well, we fixed your anatomical short leg. Well, how have you done that by elongating the bones? But you can't see the head of the femur from the external. You have to get a pelvic x-ray. Right, so absolutely. They're basing it off of assumptions and then they say, well, only one to 2% of the population actually has a, or in a structural leg length inequality. Well, well that's, un that's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 90%. 90%. That have a structural leg length, but it's about 60% that have a five millimeter or more structural difference, and that's when Travell uh, says that it becomes um, actually important. Is about five millimeters. That's when you start getting yeah. your biomechanics thrown off. So she's the only lady that's like actually sat down and developed an uh, an actual correct way to even shoot that X-ray because most chiropractors they just you know don't even care. They just shoot little x-ray of this and your cervical spine and that's it. But even if like the floor is off in the building that you're taking the x-ray in, that throws off the measurement. Right. You know what I mean, there's so many little factors that have to, and a lot of people, they don't even look at the way that their feet are placed when they're taking the x-ray. Someone could be standing like this, you know what I mean? And they don't even check that. You have to have your hips, your trochanters aligned directly with the pelvis. This is about where my natural stance is and that's where I got my x-ray taken is in this stance. But if you're like leaning over to one side or something like that, chiropractors don't even look at that. You know? And we should add on to that. Not every chiropractor does no, obviously not. Had, depends <laughs> on the practitioner. I've had awesome but chiropractors. In it's interesting how people who, of course, you spend a lot of time investing in your tool, but then it's very easy to become blind to the fact that there may be other tools that could support this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I think you mentioned when you uh, a situation with Paul St. John where. Uh, they were doing all the work that they could with a particular individual. Yeah. Um, but it turned out that it was best not to continue working with her. Yeah, well, what happened was um, we were working on a case and she came in with Lyme disease and she had a lot of s severe stuff going on. We started doing the neuromuscular work, which is a little bit more aggressive than your typical Swedish or maybe even a sports massage. Depends on who you're working with. But um, the work that we do tends to be a little bit more aggressive and in, in the initial times when we were working with we got really good results in releasing stuff. Did but you have RSD? I'm um, sorry. Limes. Yeah, limes. Oh, it was limes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So as things, as things started to go on, we noticed that her condition was actually getting worse and not improving. Oh. And um, Lyme's disease actually can turn into a neurological, neurological um, disease. So we started, they started doing work with her, and her joints were locking up quicker than they were before after yeah. we started getting releases for a long time. So you got no so, one to say, hey, I'm, right. I'm done here. Obviously, like we, we did our best. Right. But, but he's something still else might be needed. And yeah. he's just yeah. trying different modalities. A different approach. Is, you know, at first he would say, okay, I need to release all this musculature, but mm -hmm. after a while the results started to diminish. Mm -hmm. So he was like, okay, what's the next thing we can look at? Fascia. Started doing fascial work with her. It's a lot easier. It's not nearly as painful mm -hmm. as the neuromuscular work. I mean, it can be, but, you know, if you're, if you're gentle with it. Um, and then eventually stopped losing results with that. And I actually just shadowed Paul yeah. while, she was, while he was working with Anna the other day. And uh, he was doing Mr. Miyagi style Qigong healing. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's like he's pulling out all of his tools. Yes. And the thing is that it's the Lyme's disease that was keeping her that way. It, it some, I, I don't know how exactly it works, but it affects the brain stem. And this is, there's different Lyme's diseases, there's different infections that you can get. But it basically was not allowing her body to correct itself. She fell when she was at a hospital and hit her hip. And basically sheared her hip this way. What's up, dude? It sheared her pelvis this way, and she stayed like that because her body wouldn't correct itself through the musculature. And um, so she started 
uh, getting a scoliosis S-curve, like this no serious thing you've ever seen. When she lays on a table, her hips are way over here and her upper torso is way over here. Hmm. And it was because of that fall and the muscular system wasn't correcting itself for some reason. The muscles had like shut off. The tonus was super high, but they weren't working. The muscles just weren't firing. So, so how, do you get the, how do you get the muscles to fire again? Like in your case, you're saying she that has you to start Lyme disease. You know, we're not we're not doctors. We're not we're what not. What about you? Is, so you you say that you can correct your posture in the, the standing position, position, but when you go into movement, you don't fire properly. Now, how do you sure. retrain the firing patterns? And that's when I started working with Ashley, Ashley Mazurk, right. who's a Czech practitioner, functional exercise mm -hmm. trainer, that kind of thing, to see what muscles I am using and what muscles I aren't firing. So she obviously saw that I was using a bunch of little muscles. I was basically using my spine to do movements. You know right. what I mean? I have a very straight back. It's flat back because my spine is trying to straighten itself out. Oh. Um, and, and with me, I think it's, it's an energetic thing. It's definitely on more psycho-emotional side Dude, of things. You would love some of the work that I'm reading right now by Robert Scare. And he's, I mean, he's very scientific minded. You know, I began reading Lowen's work and he's poetic, but all of his ideas come from clinical experience. Sure. A lot of the stuff that the, the new, the brain scientists are doing around post-traumatic stress. That was the trauma release? Right, posted. yeah. I mean, this stuff is incredible because they're, they're brainiacs. They're yeah. talking from that end of the spectrum, which is highly respectable. And, um, and he goes, to sh goes on to show how parts of the brains that are affected by a particular trauma and our response to it are intrinsically linked to the soma, to the muscular system. Sure. And how the being trapped in that particular um, mind state associated with the trauma has deleterious effects on the muscular system and if they if their trauma isn't dealt with and we all have forms of trauma you know we tend to think of it as just as uh, you know military or, or rape or or you know things that are very violent but I mean it doesn't take anything more than like a brother who beats you up exactly. right <laughs> or, uh, or or a parent who's just really loud and aggressive with you or seductive with you or anything I mean a, a teacher who I had a teacher who used to take a pencil and like Tap the back of my head with it, and it was like, I, I, it like scarred me. I still like remember it, and every once in a while I'm like this. So I wonder if that that tick is trapped inside me. But the ticks almost like uh, they, they get caught. Your your actual response to the trauma at the particular time, if it's not discharged, gets trapped in what you would have done yeah, in the remembers. muscular system. Your body and remembers. it's like you could spend forever massaging, stretching, sure. and attempting to retrain. But if you don't deal with the psychological component, the energetic component, then it's just going to keep going back. Based, it, it, the term he uses, priming, it's just you just your brain just goes right back to it, just goes right back to it, right back to it, until eventually you have to discharge the emotional energy that's associated with it for it just to say, oh, okay, I'm done. And a lot of that stuff is uh, Peter around Peter Levine and uh, Robert Skeyer, uh David Berselli. That's like the work that these guys are doing. It doesn't look as aggressive as bioenergetics because bio. Like Lowen and, and Dr. Glazier, it's all about like attack. Like you see that there's a muscular imbalance and like he'll just go in in the same way that you guys are a bit more, like have a bit more finesse with the muscles that you go in. He'll just go, like he'll just <laughs> jab his, his fist into my neck or like just, you know, it's not as, as fine tuned, but it's just like, I know that there's tension here. I'm gonna press it and then you make some noises associated with it. Or you put someone in a really stressful bodily position or you invoke their ability to just to, to, to release, where the, the new trauma, trauma stuff is a bit more subtle. It's, it's more uh, light movements and vibrations. I'm thinking about this, I might do this, put it up, but like uh, inviting everyone to do like a daily shake. Like a lot of it is just this. Or, or getting your body or provoking subtle vibrations in your body through certain moves and, movements and stuff. It's just one more tool. Yeah. We can't look at, we can never look at ourselves as one dimensional, like, I've got it, yeah. boom, this exactly. is the answer. And that's where it comes back to building a team like you were talking right. about. Obviously, we can get your static posture good, we can normally get people out of pain, but unless you have someone looking at the psycho-emotional part of it, the functional movement part of it, and you're just gonna go back to exactly the way it works. Like, mm -hmm. The results are gonna diminish over time if you don't have a team consistently checking up on each one of those different Yeah, beliefs. well I'm happy that I got you guys here Absolutely. to talk to about this.